reality is, is you don't really need to, it, does it help to be able to see properties that you're working on, um, you know, to better understand what's going on with it. But at the end of the day, it's all data. We track all the flips and all of the rental properties nationwide. You can't solve for it. You can't solve for no comparables. They're either there or they're not there. Hey guys, my name is Sharad. I'm the owner and founder of Recently. Also an active investor in Northwest Indiana, right outside of Chicago. I do about 25, 30 flips a year. Um, and I also own about 60 rental units and a property management company. So if you have any questions on that, more than happy to answer. We have a very special guest, Benson Juarez, on this call. Uh, Benson is the uh, owner and founder of Privy, right, Benson? And yep. yeah, if you can... Share a little bit about your background, yeah. kind of how you got started, and then we can just go into the Q&A. And guys, if you're able to, if you're not driving, or if you it's safe for you to do that, if you can have your video on, that'll be great. Makes the call a lot more interactive. Yeah, definitely does. Um, well, you guys, thanks for joining. Um, so I've been in the business for over 20 years. Uh, I started, I was actually full-time uh, active duty military at the time. And uh, I was doing a lot of uh, research on different real estate investment strategies, looking for ways of getting and breaking into the market, Just reading books like Bridge Dad, Poor Dad, listening to CDs and tapes from different educators and mentors, and uh, decided to, to kind of jump in. And uh, I've been doing it for you know many, many years now, and uh, I'm a licensed real estate agent. I do uh, fix and flip, buy and hold, a wholesale, uh, recently started doing private money lending and investing into funds. And uh, so just looking for all different opportunities to uh, you know, make some money in real estate, looking at different aspects from very active income to some passive uh, income streams as well. And what market are you in, Benson? Uh, I live in the Denver market, uh, but my investments, uh, well, actually I've divested the majority of them, but uh, was in St. Louis. I was okay. looking for another market outside of, of Colorado that was um, more viable, um, you know, lower, lower price point, better margins, uh, better cap rates. And, um, but when we'll talk about this more here in a bit too, is I, I levered data to figure out which markets were going to fit my business strategy better than just trying to force the Colorado market, which unfortunately is what a lot of investors end up doing is they feel like they need to be able to see and touch the properties that they're interacting with. And the reality is, is you don't really need to, it does it help to be able to see properties that you're working on, um, you know, to better understand what's going on with it. But at the end of the day, it's all data that you're going to leverage to be able to analyze these properties and make sure they make sense from a financial perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. It always helps that, you know, when someone who's created a product also comes from the industry and still actively, you know, investing, it definitely, you, you can clearly see people that are active investors, created a product way more valuable. So if you can you know, share, you know, what markets you looked at and how are you leveraging data in your business and how do you see other investors leveraging data to make better decisions? Yeah. It's one of those things that sometimes if you've been doing it for a long time, it's, it's, you know, that whole adage of it's, it's hard to, to teach an old dog new tricks. And so for the people that have, that have their ways of doing the process, it's, it's, a little more difficult for those people to incorporate data into their normal processes, um, aside from just like, you know, basic comping, right, which is a, a data-driven activity. Um, but there's something that we extract in the Privy platform called investor activity. Investor activity is basically we track all the flips and all of the rental properties nationwide, and we look at the numbers around them. Now we don't know how what their ROI is. Like we we don't know for a fact how much money they're making because we don't know their costs, but we know what they bought it for. Uh, if we know what they sold it for, if it was a flip, we know the percentage of after repair value. And then from the landlord perspective, we can see what they're buying properties for, and then we know what the the market rents are. So we can start to get a, a sense of where people are are having success and what where they're not. And so. You know, about four years ago, I was looking for another market outside of Colorado to buy rental properties in. And, you know, in Colorado, it's, it's really tough. And, you know, it was just tough to have anything cash flow. Price points are pretty high and it was, you know, pretty challenging. So, 
you know, I, I just pulled some some reports out of Privy to see, you know, where are where are investors doing deals? And so my initial thoughts were, okay, I, I to break into a market, I'm gonna start wholesaling first. I really just want to get a sense of who the players are, who are the flippers, who are the landlords, who are the investor friendly agents, and what are their strategies. So I was able to research this investment activity to get all the, a sense of all those numbers and really get a sense of like what the local market realities were. Because before data, basically people just used universal strategies. Like you've probably heard of the 70% maximum right. allowable offer yep. strategy, right? Where you take the, the ARV, you multiply it by 70%, you subtract out your costs, maybe an assignment fee if you're doing wholesaling and that's your offer. Well, that doesn't work in every single market and people only use that strategy or usually use that strategy, we'll say, if they don't know their numbers, because they just they just try to, to figure out a price to submit. Now, what, what I found is in most cases, that was causing people to offer too little on properties, where they were offering so low that they weren't winning bids. So they're doing all of this research, they're, they're spending money on marketing, they're doing the things, and then they finally have an opportunity to submit an offer, and they're coming in so low that they have no chance of winning the bid. And then what I found is that if when you actually look at each transaction, people are offering more than what that equation was telling them to submit. And so they're basically forcing themselves out of the negotiation because they didn't really understand what the local market realities were. So it's the disconnect that they're undervaluing, they're being conserv conservative with the ARV. Is that kind of what the biggest disconnect you notice? Because like there, there's two important numbers to come up with their offer, right? Your ARV and how much it's going to cost to fix the property. And if you're wholesaling, then the assignment fee, but pretty much if you know how much you're going to sell it for and how much it's going to repair, then you can come up with a number based on that. So people are making mistakes in what they can sell for. I know in my business, honestly, it's interest. funny that you mentioned that. I literally had a call with my team last week and I said, we're being very conservative with our numbers and we're missing out some on some deals because one, we're being conservative with our ARV. Second, we're expecting to make 40, 50,000 every flip, which is unrealistic on a $200,000 re, um, right. resale value. Yeah, it was actually both. It wasn't necessarily just underestimating what the potential ARV was, but underestimating what the competition was willing to pay for a property. Because they, based off of what market is, they're typically willing to go higher on a percentage of after a pair value basis, percentage of ARV, um, than what people think. And so and the, the the county records, the tax records don't lie, right? So you can go in and you can see, okay, they bought it for, let's say in Colorado, and, and numbers have changed. But back then, like in Colorado, you could go up to like 78% of the ARV. And people were still buying at 78, flipping it, and still doing repeat business. In parts of California, they're going up to like 82, 83% of the after of hair value. So you can see who somebody who's using that 70% MAO formula would never win a bid right. when everybody else is is offering a per, higher percentage. So the reasons why are, you know, they vary, right? Like, you know, some of these people are more seasoned. Maybe they have a better control over their costs. Maybe they have got their own crews. Maybe they're buying materials in bulk. You know, maybe they're licensed agents. And so they make 3% when they buy and they save 3% when they sell. Now there's lots of, you know, reasons why that would be, but if the, if it doesn't work, if your, your your formula doesn't work in your market, you either have to find a new market or 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 change your strategy. Otherwise, you just don't win bids. Right now, maybe some people are happy doing one or two deals a year, and they don't they're they're happy you know losing out on some bids and doing all that extra work to find those one or two unicorn deals because you you can find those ones at fifty and forty percent. However, for most people, it's just not worth the the juice you get isn't worth the squeeze. So if you understand what the competition's doing, you under, you know where they're where they need to be for them to make money and where they're going to bid at, then you can be more competitive and you can win more bids. Right. So how did you leverage that in your so you looked at St. Louis as a market to invest in? Like that was the first market you looked at. Yeah. So okay. we we track all this investment activity, we plot it on a map in like this almost like a heat map. And so we would show high concentrations of investor activity. And what we what we tracked is, and this isn't a hundred percent, but there's no data point in any data set out there like 
BMLS or county records that's going to tell you that a house was definitively flipped. It just, it just nobody tracks that. But you can assume that properties were flipped if you can see that okay, there was two transactions in a short period of time. And we used 18 months, not short, short, but a little longer than what you would typically you know, think a flip would take. And then it, they bought it at 75% of the ARV or lower. Then more than 95% of the time, it's a flip, right? Because there was some forced appreciation right. that caused it to go up in value. So then once we can identify flips, then we plot them on a map and we can say, okay, these are the areas where doing another flip is more viable because this is a comparable driven business. You literally can't prove after repair value on a flip if no one's flipping around you. And for flippers, they're, well, let's say for, for wholesalers, they typically aren't thinking about what an investor or a flipper is thinking about. The, the flipper is thinking, okay, is this house going to appraise after I put all this time and effort and work into it? And the only way they're going to be able to convince an appraiser that they could, that, that property is worth what they think it is, is to give them real fix and flip properties. Now right. there's some middle ground there. Like, you know, sometimes someone has to be the trailblazer. Someone has to flip the first house, right? But they're never going to be able to maximize the total amount of money they can pull out of a house if all the comps that they've used to try to prove value are unrenovated. Because that's right. not that's but, not after repair value. But then there's going to be less competition if you know there's not enough investor activity, then like that would all balance out. But you're right, like there's one city in the market that I invest in. It's gone up so much in value where like three, four years ago, I would even touch that neighborhood, uh, that city, but now it's gone up. So there have been some investors that are buying, started buying, like we're, we're selling a house for 235 in that market. Mm -hmm. And like four or five years ago, it wouldn't have even sold for like 50, 60,000. It's incredible how I much know, the value has gone up. That snowball yeah. effect. Yes. Right? Once the comps start to appear, it attracts more people to do it, creates more comps. You know, you, you brought up the, the concept of competition and that to me is an interesting aspect. I've, I've heard some people say, well, look, well, I don't want to go to a certain market because there's too much competition, right? And, and I can understand that. But my perspective is that there's two basic problems there. One problem is no comps, which you can't solve for. You can't solve for no comparables. They're either there or they're not there, right? If I go to an area that has no comparables that I can use to establish after repair value, then I'm going to make it more difficult, difficult on myself. I'm going to, there's going to be a, some sort of a, a ceiling on the potential after repair value of that property because there are no fix and flips that are pulling that value up, right? So I can't I can't solve for that. If I go to an area that has competition, well, I've got comps, right? It's it's funny that competition and comps have the same right. core word in True. it. I can solve for that by using automation, by being hungrier, by you know being more consistent with my offers, you know, networking with better with the agents. So I can do all that work better and beat the competition. I can solve for that, but I can't solve for there's no comps, right? So you, you really have to kind of pick your battles. Now there's some markets where it's it's balanced, right? It's not like hugely over competitive, but there's still some enough activity to where you've got some comps that you can leverage. And, and those are good markets. That's why actually why I chose St. Louis. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like one of the top markets. Chicago actually happens to be one of those markets where there is, you know, just a, a ton of investor activity. Um, Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, Philadelphia are some of those those top markets. St. Louis is one of the was middle of the road. That's what so I actually looked at Chicago, but going back to what my original strategy was is that I wanted to first wholesale to get the lay of the land, do some fix and flips and then eventually start buying properties that will cash flow. So that was my strategy was was three steps, right? Three milestones. Right. And I chose against Chicago because of it's more of like a, it, it's not really landlord friendly. Right. Um, but then I looked at Indianapolis, which is another middle of the road market that it has, um, you know, good investor activity, St. Louis, Kansas city was another market I, I was looking at eventually settled on St. Louis. And so I did, um, several deals out there, First, it was 100% virtual in Colorado and only doing on-market deals. So it was all on-market, wholesale, 100% virtual for like the first six transactions. And then I started to do some other strategies once I got the lay of the land there. What's a good mix of 
investor activity versus like, you know, your traditional homeowner activity. I mean, there could be areas that are really saturated with investors. And then, especially if it's mostly tenant occupied, is that kind of what you look at that the, what percentage of the homes are owner occupied versus tenants occupied? Because my understanding has been, if it's majority tenants occupied, then the people that you're going to sell to are going to be investors. And they're going to look at basically the ROI, mostly for rental property. So there's always going to be a cap on how much you can sell the property for based on how much you're renting for. So if the rents right. go up, the value of the house is going to go up. Is that kind of what you looked at? And if you don't mind, kind of, you know, you're more than welcome to share your screen and go over the analysis of how Yeah, you, uh, no, it's funny. There weren't any sort of like, what would you call it? like measurement sticks as far as what threshold I was trying to stay above or below. Right. Right? Some people are like, well, how much investor activity is adequate how much investor activity is too much um w w the way i looked at it was is more about relative investor activity so compared to each other right so let me i will be able to show you this to give you a little bit more sort of insight into what i'm talking about here and it's that's why i like this strategy too because it's it's pretty um intuitive you don't have to be somebody that's been doing this for a long time you know somebody who's really really experienced like you can look at these these heat maps that we build and um start to get a, a really good sense of what's going on just with you know the average eye it doesn't have to be an expert eye so let me let me log in here and just while you're logging in is midwest still a pretty hot market for investors i mean i invest in indiana right outside of chicago and my main reason for I used to live in Chicago, but my main reason for investing in Indiana was kind of why you did not choose Chicago, that it was not a landlord friendly market at all. So right. I just decided to go over the border, across the border to Indiana. And it's it's been really great for us. But what are yeah. your thoughts on like Midwest market overall? Indianapolis is still fairly good. Um, it's still yeah. viable. You know, the, the hot areas shift. And that's one of the cool things about the way that we track it is it's it's constantly updating every hour so okay. it's a rotating 12 months and it's at all adjustable like you can change the timelines okay. but one of the other things that i wanted to do when i was basically creating my checklist of markets i wanted to potentially target was number one i wanted you know a good amount of investor activity i wanted there to be comparables there that i could use to do my research to understand what was happening on the ground and i also wanted that uh, the direct to MLS data. So that's one of the things that we have in Privy that is pretty unique is we go and we negotiate data contracts directly with the MLS. So wherever you see blue on the map is where we have those direct to MLS data contracts. And it's okay. over 120 markets. So okay. you can see here, Indianapolis, St. Louis, we have that direct data. Uh, over here on the left is where we track that investment activity. So if I click this button right here that says fix and flip, that plots on the map where all the investor activity is nationwide. And then I can visually see which markets have high investor activity, which ones are moderate, which wow. ones don't have any. And just to be clear, the, what you classified fix and flip is if the property sold twice within 18 months, correct? And they bought it lower than 75% of that after a pair value. Oh, so, so you also look at it, bought it less than 75% and it sold within 18 months. Yeah, bought it, fixed it up, sold it within an 18 month period. And that, that we use that 75% threshold. Okay. So just to be clear, let's say if they sold the property for 200,000, they must not, uh, the, the purchase price must not exceed 150,000, 75% 200. Yep. Okay. Yep. Interesting. So it would be very unique for a house to go up $50,000 in value in that same time period. Right. Unless, it, unless it was forced appreciation. Right. All right. Okay. It's 75% so, based on, I, I'm sorry, just really quick about 75. Yeah. Is that based on kind of some data that you've looked at? Because some markets, like you mentioned, people will go up to 80% in California and Southern California. So any reason why you had the cutoff at 75%? Yeah, just for automation and for simplicity. So we wanted to- I think it's, to, it's a pretty reasonable number. To click just one button and do right. it but if you wanted to adjust it you can come in here you can, uh, oh, you can I play see. with the slider perfect but we baked okay. 70% into this button here so you could just click one button get it on the map and then make you know massage the data to fit your your needs okay but this is how we start right so you perfect. can see like there's some holes 
right? There, there are areas where people just aren't flipping. And, and the data that we are extracting comes from both MLS and from county record data. Okay. So it isn't just stuff that's sold on the MLS. It could, be, it could have been acquired off market and sold on market. You could have bought from the MLS and then sold on the MLS or vice versa. So we're, we're tracking all of these, these, the sales activity, you know, right here, you know, like if you live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, you know, people's first thought is I'm going to go look for deals where I live. Right. But it, it's just not going to be viable for them. Could they stumble into a deal? Yeah. But nobody's in this business to just do one deal. Right. They want to first cut their teeth, learn the business, and then they're going to start to scale. So as you start to move to the Midwest, look at how these numbers jump. Right. This sit right here is the Chicago market. Look at that, 4,300 flips in the last 12 months, greater Chicago area. Look at Milwaukee, Indianapolis. And then you can drill it down. So Chicago would be Chicago slash Northwest Indiana, I assume, right? That's that's the metropolitan. Yeah, area. yeah. Once you get closer, okay. like if I click this cluster here, the cluster will start to break up into smaller clusters and then you'll get oh, okay. more clarity on specific neighborhoods. Because we're not just saying, yeah, go and invest in, in all of Chicago land. Like, down here in Plainfield, like there's not a whole lot going on, right? So right. if I'm really looking for a lot of data that, that can help me, I'm going to be in Southside Chicago, right? Right. So if I drill down even further, then you're starting to look at, okay, look, Roseland is going to be an area that is going to have all of the ingredients that I need to be able to assemble a deal. And then- but in that small section, there's like 99 flips that happened last, you said 12 months or 18 months? 12 months. 12 months. Wow. Yep. So like if I center this again, and once we get close enough, these clusters, they break up into each individual transaction. So these, each one of these is a flip. And it'll show you the sale price and the purchase price. Yep. So over here on the left, if I click this right here, like look how up to date this, this house actually sold today. This house wow. right here on Torrance. So this is one of the advantages of the, that. Why I like this direct to MLS area is because if this was just coming from county record, we might not know about this sale for a week or more. Right. Right. But because the the agent went back and put it into the MLS, it immediately got fed right back to us. And then now we can look at the, the, the transactional details. So this right here is a comparative market analysis. So it brings in the pictures, the property details, and then we have a section down here that that pulls the comparables for you. So it uses all the major property characteristic to pull in the comps. Now you can you can you can see we only have one data point here, which means that this house is fairly unique. It's eighteen hundred square feet. That's probably big for the neighborhood. Um, but if we click here on all, that removes the comping algorithm, and then it'll show you everything in the area. But look at there's there's a bunch of other properties that we hid that weren't comparable enough. We use a 15% tolerance on the square feet. We match up property type style. Um, we use a half a mile radius there, but this is where it gets fun right here. It's down here is the before and after data on the flip. And this is where the next step for me after I chose St. Louis was, well, what is a deal? Like, let's try to do some market research. So this is the property before they, they flipped it. So they bought it in February of this year. Here's they the bought before. it right on MLS. This was an on-market deal. Right, this was an on-market deal. And it'll show you how much they paid for it. And obviously, we know they sold it for two seventy-five. dollars Yep, they bought it for one eighteen. They sold it for two seventy-five. They got it at 43% of the after repair value. Okay. And then over here is the after. So we can see like what kind of materials they use, what kind of, of construction they did. You know, is this a neighborhood where you can get away with a rental grade rehab or do you have to do something more high end to meet, you know, the bar for that particular neighborhood? Um, but you get you can get design ideas, really. But okay. this, I think, is, is a great blueprint for especially newer flippers who may have seen like a fix and flip show on HGTV and they think that they have to put chandeliers in every room and, you know, granite countertops and everything. And maybe they're leaving money on the table because that's like, what they would want to live in or what they saw some fix and flipper do, but it might be a neighborhood where you just, you do Formica, you paint the cabinets, you put new pools, new, you know, new, um, 
appliances and you're, you're off and running. So 143%. We can see timelines. So if you're trying to estimate how long a project is going to take, so you can factor in interest and maybe insurance costs or anything that's going to take, you know, time. They did this construction in 152 days. Probably priced it a little too high because it was on the market for 50 days, but not so low to where it sold the next day. Mm -hmm. And then we can come in here and we can see who the flipper was. So if I'm a, a wholesaler and I'm trying to build a buyer's list, then Innova Group is somebody that I would potentially want to work with because I know they're actively flipping properties right now. Right. There's a question Tyler Scott has. Uh, yeah. What criteria or data points are most important when evaluating markets for Novations nationwide? Oh, that's a good one. Novations is such a, a niche. I don't know, Tyler. That's a that's a really good question. So Thank explain you. to me what a Novation is for you. Is this is this about yeah. like partnering with the homeowner? Yeah. Yeah, I, I should have. Um, yeah, I should have. Uh, I'm part of sub two also, and a lot of times they they ask me what I mean by innovation. I've noticed that people have different definitions, um, and I guess there's different ways to do it, right? But basically, all we're doing is getting that uh, attorney. In fact, some people call it our limited power of attorney to allow us to list the property on MLS. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times, we're doing a very very light clean out, or helping them move the furniture out of the property. I've I've never spent more than you know, $2,500 on an ovation deal. And then we're just putting that property on the MLS and, you know, sometimes cash buyers will buy it, but sometimes retail buyers will buy it. So, you know, that we're, we're really just looking to scale out of our local market, you know, just, just trying to see like what data points would make sense to, to choose markets for that kind of strategy. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that explanation. Let me ask you this. Do you measure how good a good novation deal is? Do you measure on a percentage of ARV basis? Is that one of the measuring sticks for you? ARV, percentage of ARV? Um, um, I would say, uh, you know, what I look at more than than I do anything on innovation is what's the as-is value? What's the current value of the property and its current condition? What will it sell for on the market in the next 30 days or less? Um, that's I really like to try to look at that as-is number, but that's the approach we kind of take there. I mean, of course, we still look at ARV, but... So um, if ARV is included in the way that you guys decide whether to do a deal or not do a deal, then the search that I just did would be valuable for you. Because if you're in a market where no one's flipping and you're not, you're going to be able to leverage those fix and flip properties to pull the values up in those neighborhoods, then it's really difficult to understand what the value could be if it's, if you put a little bit of money into it. Right. So, right. so this investor, this fix and flip button would be valuable for you. Okay. Aside from that, honestly, Tyler, I can't think of anything. Maybe you can, Sherrod. Yeah, I was I was I'll thinking like, about the same thing. Like, it would be very correlated with the investor activity. Like, at least the investors that I know that are doing like bunch of these every month, they they're doing innovation in areas that are have good investor activity. They're not doing it in these market. I mean, they may list some properties in a market where there's not enough activity. Then it's going to have a tough time selling, but yeah, that's to your point. Like at least investors that I know, it's just a different exit strategy. It's still the yeah. fundamentals in the market, you know, that that you have to start out with kind of what Benson mentioned. Like you have to have good fundamentals and then innovation is just another way to exit out of it. Like, so let's say if, you know, if I had the cash, if I had unlimited cash, then I would just buy the property, you know, at a price, it makes sense. And then just list it myself. With novation, you don't have to put money into it, and then you still let, listing it on the MLS. But you still have to see that there's enough demand in the market from other investors, uh, you know that Correct. that would be willing to take it down, and then you know it come back comes back on the market as a flip later on. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, most of the novations we've sold, a few of them have gone to cash buyers because we just priced them right. right. Maybe we we sh we could have priced them higher, but a lot of them we're giving them over to retail buyers because a lot of them they're in that average condition. Yeah. If they're wear, functional, like, then of course yeah. you could just sell it to a retail buyer. That's going to take it and then maybe put some sweat equity in it. But yeah, you would still need the activity from investors or homeowners for it to be excited. But if it's like gotcha. a total fixer up or kind of what the property that uh, 9720 is South Torrance, then you would you would want to see that they're investors buying, right? It would depend on the condition of the property also that 
if it's a total fixer upper, then the homeowner is not going to be eligible for financing on that deal. So you would want that investor to take that. But if it's a, like we're closing on a deal this week that has a tenant occupied, but it's functional, move-in ready. We're going to evict the tenant, put it back on the market, clean it up. But then we're just closing on it, putting a little bit of money, put it back on the market. It could sell to an investor or it could also sell to a homeowner. Mm-hmm. Correct. Got you. So yeah. I, I would maybe days on market is definitely a big thing to look at too when doing ovations because you really want to make sure they're moving For quick. Sure. And uh, I, I like what you said there with the, activity there and i like that you could see like which ones were flips and some of those ones that were in average condition that they brought to excellent right uh those would be my my as is comps to kind of see what the current value of the property is so i think that helps out a lot too just having a lot of data like benson was saying you know to go off of is is super key i think regardless of exit strategy right having that data definitely helps yeah yeah it just gives more clarity it takes out you know much of the guesswork out there because otherwise you're just kind of shooting in the dark um, so which mark, where do you live now, Tyler, which market um, do you live in? Yeah, I've been, I've been wholesaling in new Orleans for about seven years now. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I had it at a point where it's kind of automated in the background. I was using Podio and, uh, my, my sales rep was kind of running, doing everything. And, um, we got to a point where we we're just hitting the ceiling constantly. And I was like, he kind of got burnt out. The market shifted a little bit and I jumped back in. I was like, all right, we need to make some huge changes. And, I made the decision like we're going to go virtual and we just been in build mode. I chose resimply as a CRM. I just hired five new sales reps, commission base, and I'm just turning up the marketing dial. We have a bunch of cold callers too. And we're just, um, just kind of really setting everything up, but we're following, uh, we got a, pro- a sales process that we're following, just kind of focus on novations and, you know, we'll, we'll wholesale too, but I just like being able to bring those deals to the open market, especially mm-hmm. in markets where I don't have the buyers list like I do here in my backyard. Yeah. You know, a market you might consider, um, is Dallas. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're it's, looking at that. Yeah. It's, it's fairly close. Like, I mean, it's, it's not too far of a drive if you wanted to go down there for some stuff, but like if I pull out here, um, let me look at the investor activity again. Uh, Dallas has, I mean, like, again, it's, it's fairly close. What is that? Like, do you think like a six hour drive for you? Yeah. Yeah. About, I've been there a couple of times. Yeah. Dallas is, is, uh, and that's that's things I've been looking at. Like I've been trying to pull together the data. It's something I've been working on this week. Is um, it's kind of one of my rocks right now. Is is to focus on which markets exactly. Because right now I have the reps just calling our old local leads, and they're getting deals. But it's like I, I want to really start getting the cold callers that we have the new leads for the for the new list, and mm-hmm. and um, it's just really picking those markets. And I've have I have a little experience with picking virtual markets. I mean, I've done a couple virtual deals in the past, just testing it out. But um, I was really going off of like population, like, because that's the thing with New Orleans, we're losing a lot of population. I think that affects our market in a way. I think that's yeah. a, you know, job Man's growth. I was in. like looking at those, those major metrics like that and just kind of putting them in a spreadsheet by, by county, right? It's like, all right, which, but I, th- I feel like there's more data than that. It's like, what's the days on market? What's the supply and demand? What's the, what's Benton, the average? Would you also... Just to help Tyler with research, would you also say kind of, you know, the conclusion that you came to and I came to is like, if you're going to do virtual, then you'll be better off going to a market that's more landlord friendly, because then you open up to investors that might be interested in buying, you know, a turnkey property or a rental property versus if you're in a market like Chicago, you're going to have, you're going to limit the type of investors you can sell to versus if you're in Indiana or Dallas uh, you're going to open it up to people that might be interested in buying rental properties. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. It's, it's that concept of, um, you know, a rising tide raises all ships, right? So if you're in a market where it's viable for, for cash flow, it's landlord friendly and there's fix and flips, that's going to drive appreciation up in those areas greatly. And that's going to attract more landlords who want to do long-term rentals, um, so that's why I think that Dallas would be good, even Houston. Um, but the both the, Dallas is better than Houston. Houston's better than Austin. I'm sorry, San Antonio and, and Austin's kind of trailing um behind. But you might even consider Shreveport. You ever looked at Shreveport? Yeah, i w I've I've heard good things about it. Um actually. I just haven't, you know, I haven't really picked the markets yet. You know, yeah. um, it's like I have the system ready to go. It's just really getting get in the right markets, get in the right list out of those markets and just getting the cold callers to handle those, those leads. Yeah. And not to, you know, talk about, 
you know, privy too much, but we do have that direct to MLS data in Dallas because Dallas or Texas in general, it's a um, non-disclosure state. So if you don't have that direct to MLS data, it's really difficult to analyze yeah. properties and get true data. Uh, they won't even publish the sales price of a house for anything inside of Texas. But we have it because ours is a closed system and you can see prices, um, you know, true comparables. It updates just as often as it does in Chicago. Um, so Dallas is a market that I would definitely consider. Shreveport, it's still in Louisiana, but right there on the border. And if you were going to choose two virtual markets, that would be a great way to go. And it's because you have Shreveport still local, only three or four hours away. And then you could just take that road over to Dallas and check on, you know, some stuff over there. And it's still relatively close, but I've always had the, the idea that when you're choosing virtual markets, if it's too far to drive, it, it might as well be the other side of the country. Like it doesn't matter. Right. So, but if it's close enough like this and you've got viable markets that are within driving distance, then that certainly can help. But, but you know, how often are you going to drive to Dallas? Probably not very often. I, I have a quick question for you. Is there a way to see how competitive the market is like, have you guys been able to figure out a way? Like for the last house that you showed that sold for 43% off the ARV. I mean, again, it, it all depends on how much work it needs, yeah. but based on like some data points that, you know, in this case, that's a title can look at or someone, you know, who's looking at a new market can look at. And based on the data that you guys have, they can see like how competitive the market is. Yeah. I mean, we don't have any sort of direct KPIs that track competitiveness right? Like, I don't know if there's some sort of um, like a ranking, like this market's more competitive than others. I, I think it's partially true. What you said earlier is the more investor activity, the more competition is going to be, but it's a balance, like I said before. But what I typically do is once I go into a market, I look at the last like 10 to 20 sold flips in that area. And I look at the percentage of ARV and I can start to see like, that's what your competition is doing, right? Mm -hmm. So you're starting to understand their buy box. You start to understand, you know, what they're interested in their, their percentage of ARV. So, so if you click on any one of these houses, like anyone that flipped, mm -hmm. right. So if the before happened off MLS, then would you have the data on how much it sold for in Texas? Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this was another on market deal. Okay. But if it was off market, what we would show here is the street view. Okay. And then we would still have the price down here. So even in a non-disclosure state? Even a non-disclosure state. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Louisiana is too. So I'm aware with that. Yeah. It certainly makes it challenging. Here's another thing I learned that I was pretty surprised about was, you know, I had this misconception that, you know, you can only find good deals direct from seller. And I started looking at the data and I found more and more of these houses just like this, where people were finding on market properties they needed work where they were getting them at you know, pretty decent discounts. Like this is yeah. 50%. This investor didn't have to spend any money on marketing. Yeah. Right? We're noticing the same thing in Indiana. And just really quick, like I, I know this is like a one of very small, you know, just one sample site. So yeah. the one in Chicago was 43% off the ARV. This is 58. But if you look at, I'm just thinking a lot. If you looked at in, you know, let's say 15, 20 properties, then you notice that, Texas or Dallas in this case, were consistently higher ARV, uh, percentage of ARV for purchase. Is it is it safe to assume that that is a more competitive market? Yeah, I, I think that's representative of, of competitiveness is that they have to go to a higher percentage of ARV. But you were exactly right. I don't think any one data point's going to give you everything you need to see. So yeah. that's why I go back to like the last 10 to 20 and I start to figure out like a median percentage of ARV and a median sales price. But then again, you just never know what motivates an investor, you know, or do they just need mm -hmm. to keep their crews busy because they, they don't want to lose them to some other flipper. So they're, they go in at 80% and they just happy breaking even like, so that outlier, you know, might make someone think, oh, I can go up to 80% too. Right. But it's really, it's not representative of the whole market. Is there, is there a way to see it privy what? If I just wanted to see where the both buy side and I mean sell side, of course, happened on MLS, but the buy side op also happened on MLS. If I just wanted to see that, because that would indicate the more properties that are where the investor bought on MLS and also sold on MLS, 
like just my initial gut feeling would be that that is a less competitive market because more properties are just selling on MLS versus let's say in California, you know, an investor would need to really, or the flips would really come off market. I'm just making it up. Is that possible to see? You can see it, but we don't have it in any sort of like aggregated data, okay? like snapshot. Right. So, you know, you, you look at one and then you, you come down to the next one. Right. And this, and you can do this, this whole like research project in like 15 minutes. So it doesn't right. take a lot of time, but you come down here and you look at, okay, another on market deal. That's interesting. Also at 58%. Wow. Right? I would have never thought that like, especially in my initial gut would be Dallas. You would find very, very few deals on market for flips. This is really good information. Yeah, and it really helps you to position your yeah. your dollars on where you what are you going to spend your money at. Um, here's another here's a third data point, and and these are initially sorted by sold date. So we're showing the most recent solds at the top of the list. There's different ways to sort them. We just sort them by sold date um, on the first pass. On market, wow. it's a little little bit higher though, sixty three percent. But that could be like consistently, these have all been higher than 55%. And then if you like someone looked at Chicago, let's say Tyler was looking at Chicago and comparing Chicago or Dallas. And if Chicago you consistently notice that, you know, the percentage of ARV is like 50 or below 50 or lower than Dallas, then you, you could say that, you know, reasonably that Dallas is a little bit more competitive market, at least based on the MLS listed properties, than it might be the Chicago might be. Yep. This is on market 57%. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's like, there's the, the quantitative data, right. Which is like the numbers and this, right. I would consider qualitative, which is it's, it's a data point that can help you make decisions that isn't necessarily like a number. Yeah. And then, and then this proves that anybody that says there are no deals to be found on MLS, you have the data you see, there are definitely deals to be found on MLS. Yeah. And for all we know, this could be a novation deal, Tyler. You know, yeah, yeah, it could, yeah. Have been, yeah. This could have been an innovation deal. Yeah. Um, yeah, potentially. So, yeah, now we can, and I guess we can take this one step further, even too, is now that we've we know that there's on market deals, we can actually leverage that data and model against it for stuff that's on market right now that we could buy. So, this button right here where it says find similar active deals. That'll take all of these sold deals and use those as a model and then reverse engineer it. So here's a property right here. It's a three, one. It just came on the market today. And obviously, you know, dated. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at the comparables down here, the reason why this property was flagged as a deal is because this house just recently sold for 265 grand. Now, comparing those two prices, the ask price to the sold price of the comparable, that puts it at 72% of the after repair value um, without asking for a discount. Now, that button that I initially pushed, again, has a default amount of 75%, but we learned that there were stuff let's say lower than 60%, right? We thought we saw 57, 58, let's lower that. And then let's say Tyler talked to his lender and you know he's approved for 340 or less, right? You can basically essentially build your buy box in here, bedrooms, baths, all sorts of things. There's also an algorithm for long-term rentals and you can look at cap rates, cash on cash return that pulls in the rental data, compares it to the price of the house. And then we have some assumptions that we have there to find cash flowing properties, but let's see if there's anything that could make sense. So here's this house. It's three, two nice sprawling ranch, you know, original flooring, definitely places where we could add value. And there's going to be data here that says that this thing would be less than 60%. So our house is 259. This house down the street, that's a comp sold for 500. They bought theirs for 260 that we can actually get this one for 259. And so this house at asking price without even negotiating a discount, um, same bedrooms, bathrooms, the square footage, um, very similar. Puts it at 
you can write an offer on this one right now. Right. Interesting. And Tyler, you could use this as for your comps when you are, you know, negotiating with the sellers. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, because that's that's one thing we do bring up with the seller in our call is, you know, we, we do bring up some anchor comps on, on the anchor call, you know, so um, coming up with, with showing them as is values because a lot of sellers like to bring the best comps forward and we show them the ones that were, you know, similar to theirs or, or lower, right? Yeah. But yeah, access to this these off market comps and, and these comps and stuff too. Does it show off market data also? Like, yeah, it'll show all, all the the data points. So like, if I just so this right here, we isolate the comp that shows this thing matches our percentage of ARV criteria, which we set at sixty percent. There's other sales here that had lower price points. And so anything that sold on the MLS is has a blue line on it. Anything that sold off market has a silver line. So these are all off awesome. market sales. Gotcha. So it's funny too, actually this, this one that sold for 500 K is a model match. It's exact same square footage. Oh, actually, never mind. That was the, the previous. So 2162, we use a 15% tolerance. So this, you might have to make a, an adjustment for this because this is on the, the edge of it being just a little bit too big, but it's still within 15%. Yeah, but I, I think it gives you a fairly good idea on like how much you can, you know, flip it for or if it's a good potential flip or not for you. Yeah. Cool. So I'll actually, I'll, I'll send this one to you, Tyler. You can check it out. I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. And then the last part about this too, is if I come in and I want to be notified next time something pops up, I can save the filter and then get alerts up to every hour on new properties that match my deal criteria. And you can set them up all across the nation. So if you wanted to like test out Dallas and Shreveport and Chicago, you could have multiple searches running and it'll just email you every time a property is found that matches that criteria and the one in Chicago might be set to 50% or lower. And, but in gotcha. Dallas, we know, you know, we can go at least go up to 60. Yeah. And I will say too, with our innovations, you know, we still going are going off market because our, you know, we're trying to bring them to the market, you know, get them under contract and bring them to the MLS. That's kind of the strategy we've been using lately, yeah. but these would be good comps. So for sure, I would say, um, sure. Uh, another i was i had one more question too about them um, is there a way to see like the average days on market like on a national view like kind of like zoom into a market no, and, and or no like by zip code or not right now there's um there's something on the roadmap right now that we're building that's going to give um more analytics and kpis of, of specific markets but not currently gotcha because that's that's the biggest struggle i have right now is really just like what data points do i need and i know it's not just one particular data point that in the right direction to a certain market but and you know we are planning on doing everything virtual so it could be you know anywhere it's just like what i've been trying to find like what data points matter the most like i would i would think days on market and like supply you know how many active listings versus you know supply and demand i guess and i guess a few other data points there it's just like that's a that's a question i've been asking myself right like what data points yeah. do i need to be looking at? population growth hard because it isn't always influenced by just the market in my opinion days on market really has to do with like list price like if the agent lists it too high or the homeowner has a number in their mind and they list it because they're trying to like just get the most out of it it's going to set gotcha but it doesn't necessarily represent the health of the market if it's sat for a while because the agent could have just been you know could have just messed up yeah that makes sense that makes sense all right. So hope that helped. Yeah, Benson, this was great. I want to be respectful of your time, Benson. So if someone wants to learn more about Revy, connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, they can email me um, and I'm happy to show them more about the system, but it's just Benson at privy.pro and you can just email me and I'm happy to do a little due diligence on what you're trying to solve for and, and seeing if Privy makes sense. It might not for you, but um, if it does, I'm, I'm happy to help. Awesome, Benson. Thank you so much, Vincent. I really appreciate your time. I know how busy you are, so I appreciate you coming on the Mastermind call and sharing the wealth of knowledge you have. Thank you. Oh, Thank you're you. welcome. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Cool. Appreciate awesome, guys. Here. Thank you for being on the call. See you guys next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.